Good afternoon, everyone. Let me start with some opening remarks. Yahya Sinwar, the leader of Hamas who was killed in an Israeli military operation in Gaza yesterday, was a brutal, vicious terrorist responsible for the death of American citizens, Israelis, and civilians from more than 30 countries across the world. His decision, and it was very much his decision, to launch the terrorist attacks of, of October 7th unleashed a year of tragedy in the Middle East. 1,200 people murdered on October 7th. 254 hostages kidnapped and hauled into Gaza, including children, infants, elderly, and men and women of all ages. More than 40,000 people dead in Gaza, many of them civilians. That is the blood-soaked legacy that Yahya Sinwar leaves behind. He didn't just launch this conflict, but for the past year has refused the efforts of the, of the United States and our partners to end it, refused to return home the hostages who have been separated from their families for more than a year, refused to agree to a ceasefire proposal endorsed by the United Nations Security Council and countries around the world, and who in recent weeks refused to even negotiate at all on a ceasefire and an end to the war. There are 101 hostages who remain in Gaza, including seven Americans. And of course, there are two million Palestinians who continue to suffer the consequences of Sinwar's decision to endanger their lives. The path that Sinwar wanted for the region, death, destruction, instability, chaos, is a path that we know the people of the region reject. The horrors of the past year cannot be the future, and they do not need to be the future. It is time to chart a different path. So over the days ahead, the United States will redouble our efforts to return the hostages home, to bring an end to this war, to alleviate the suffering of the Palestinian people, and to allow the people of Gaza to begin to rebuild their lives. With that, Matt. Okay. Um, I'll start with this, obviously, but please don't close the briefing without uh, allowing me or someone else to ask about the other very big story of the day, which is, of course, the new UN partition proposal for Western Sahara. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so when you say that over the course of the day, over the coming, over the days ahead, the U.S. will redouble <clears throat> your efforts, how exactly um, is that going to happen? So uh, a few things about that. First of all, as you know, we've been trying to achieve a ceasefire that returns the hostages home, alleviates the suffering of the Palestinian people, and ends the war, war for m many months now. And the chief obstacle to reaching that ceasefire and bringing it into the war has been Sinwar, who has refused to negotiate at all in recent weeks and has said no time and time again. That obstacle has obviously been removed. Can't predict that that means that whoever replaces Hamas will agree to a ceasefire, but it does remove what has been in recent months the chief obstacle to getting one. So we're going to continue to work with our partners to try to find an end to the war. The Secretary already today, while on Air Force One with the President flying to Berlin, uh, called the Prime Minister of Qatar, who has been one of our two uh, mediators, uh, other mediators, working to uh, reach an end to the war. Uh, he called the Foreign Minister of Saudi Arabia to talk about the path forward, and he will be having additional contacts uh, in the days ahead. Right, but what exactly does, does redouble your efforts mean? So it means redoubling our efforts to try and get an agreement no, no, that would bring I, I the get, hostages home. Look, I'm, I'm not going to so, you so, for the logistics. Uh, I understand what you want. So, I, I want to know what that actually means, redouble. Does it mean that you're going to be making twice as many calls? So you, you know were? the proposal that has been on the table for some time. We're going to be right. trying to push that, that proposal forward. We now have a different... Well, we don't know who will be on the other end of the negotiating table now, but it certainly won't be Sinwar. So there's a different, uh, it is a very different situation. Now, I, I don't want to predict too much what our efforts will look like over the, the course of the days, because we are just hours after what is a seismic event um, that changes the nature of this conflict. But we believe it is an opportunity to try and bring it into this war, and we're determined to try and seize that opportunity. Okay, but so you... But but in, so I, are, we, reason, are you going reason, back to a place where 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 you were two or three two months ago? 
because I just don't get the redoubling we are, we are suggests in, so that you're we are, from going a, to from a policy perspective and what we a strategic objectives perspective what we want to achieve we are in the same place and we are going to continue to try to push forward the same proposals we have done same, with our with our mediators. So, okay, they, so now, redoubling they're, they're, does not include the, changes. So it that. goes. So here's the difference. Over the past few weeks, there have been no negotiations for an end to the war because Sinwar has refused to negotiate. There's been no path to ending this war because Sinwar has refused to talk about releasing the hostages or, or coming to a ceasefire. We now see an opportunity with him have, being removed from the battlefield, being removed from the leadership of Hamas, and we want to seize that opportunity. Okay, thanks. Shelley. Um, a couple of things. Can you confirm that Sinwar died yesterday? Uh, he was, uh, so I assume that he died yesterday. So I will leave the, the Israelis to speak to the exact results, but it was a, as the result of an operation that they conducted yesterday. I don't believe that he lay uh, uh, where he uh, was brought down for hours and died later, but the Israelis can speak to that. They will be, uh, they will be the ones that um, conduct any testing and, and uh, so no can provide any results. No confirmation, but that's your... The, the, the operation they carried out was yesterday. I assume that he died instantly or fairly shortly thereafter, but the Israelis can speak to that. Um, does Qatar, does the leadership in Qatar, after the secretary spoke to them, do, do you suspect or do you know if they know who Hamas's chosen successor is going to be? Uh, I don't think anyone can say with any certainty. Hamas has a process that they go through in these situations. We saw them go through that process after the death of Hanea. Uh, I could only expect that they will go through that process again. Um, I, I don't think anyone can predict. People can always speculate, of course, about who the next leader of Hamas will be, but I don't think anyone can predict with any degree of, of certainty. Um, but what I would hope, what we would hope, is that whoever the next leader of Hamas is, he will look at what has happened over the past year and look at the suffering that Hamas's actions have brought upon the Palestinian people who they aim to represent, whose cause they aim to advance, and will look and decide that they ought to pursue a different path forward. They ought to pursue a path that isn't one of death and destruction and chaos and harm to Israeli civil civilians and harm to Palestinian civilians, but one that the United States has presented, that Egypt has presented, that Qatar has presented, that other countries in the region and around the world have presented and endorsed. And so that's what we'll, pu we'll be pushing for. Are you communicating that to, uh, to indirectly, you know, to, I guess, the remaining leadership there that, you know, have you, are you communicating that is the United States hope and what you're pushing for? We, so I'm not going to speak about any communications that our mediators will have. We always let them speak to those. We are communicating with Qatar. We'll be communicating with other partners in the region. I think that our position is fairly well known. Now, of course, we don't know who the, the uh, person at the other end of the phone is going to be. We don't know who will be making decisions for Hamas now. What we do know is that the person who had been the chief obstacle to moving forward with an end of the war is now fortuitously no longer with us. Um, last question. Um, I, so I know that you hope this is a big opportunity for ceasefire negotiations and a deal and return of the hostages, but a little more macro. What about for a two-state solution? Of How do you think this? Of course, that is the the goal that we want to see. That has been our policy for some time. We ultimately um, want to see a path forward that allows. Palestinians in Gaza to rebuild their lives, uh, to rebuild their neighborhoods, um, to have security, to have Palestinian-led governance that they choose, not that it's imposed upon them uh, by the outside world, um, to live free from the grip of a brutal terrorist organization as, the, uh, uh, as opposed to how they have been living in Gaza for the past couple of decades, um, and ultimately uh, an independent Palestinian state where the Gaza is, is reunited with the West Bank. But is that, that's just like a lot of hope and no chance, or have you seen any, I don't know, indications that, that could, this could create an opening? For well, for, I, I, I do want to just step back, and, and this, I think, it will be uh, an answer I give to a lot of questions like that today, which is we are just hours after a very significant event. I think we're going to have to, to watch and see how things settle before people can make predictions about how the days, weeks, and months ahead will play out. One thing we do know for certain is that the world is a better place with Sinwar gone from it, and it gives us an opportunity that we didn't have as long as he still called the shots for Hamas. Now, what that will mean, 
we'll have to wait and see in the days ahead. Yeah. Um, could I ask something? You said that you know, this removes an obstacle. Uh, on the Secretary's last visit to, uh, to Israel, he said very publicly that uh, Netanyahu was on board with the ceasefire plan as it stood with the, with the bridging proposal. Does that still, is that still the, uh, the perception in the United States that the Israelis are completely on board with, with what was on the table? So they, were, they had accepted the bridging proposal. And if you remember what else he said at the time is there were still remaining uh, uh, pieces to that deal that needed to be agreed between Hamas and Israel. So we had gone significantly down the road and first getting an agreement on the framework, then getting an agreement on the bridging proposal. But there were still a number of implementing details that needed to be um, uh, implemented or need to be agreed to. And that Israel was going to face some tough decisions in getting there, and we were going to do, going to push Israel to make those tough decisions. But the, and so that remains the case. But what happened in the interim after that visit is that Hamas just walked away from the negotiating table. And so the work that we wanted to do to bridge those final differences we couldn't do because you didn't have two partners uh, to talk to. So, but what again, of course, is that you know there was the issues of the Philadelphia corridor and and all that. Is it the impression of the United States that that there needs to be efforts as well with the Israelis right now, maybe push them a little bit harder to uh, to get to the place where the U.S. wants them to be? So, uh, as I said, of course there will be tough decisions that the Israelis will will need to make to get an agreement to end this war. And we have made clear any number of times that we will have very direct, candid conversations with them about the need to make those tough decisions. Um, but we weren't even in a place to do that when you have no one at the other end of the table willing to even agree to negotiate. So you can't tell the Israelis they have to make tough decisions when Sinwar is sitting on the other side saying, I'm not even going to negotiate the end of this at all. Um, we're now in a different place. What that means going forward, too early to tell, but we do believe it is an opportunity that we want to pursue. And just uh, pursuing that, I mean, the, um, you know, obviously the, the we're talking about Gaza right now, but of course there's Lebanon. And there's there's the war has it's clearly expanded from from where we were a, a few months ago. Uh, when we're saying that the when when the secretary and the president are saying that it's time to to end the conflict, does it also mean in Lebanon? Um, is that is it the time also to, to end the conflict? We do want to see ultimately a diplomatic re resolution and all. Now, look, you face a different situation in Lebanon. There are still Hezbollah forces uh, in close proximity of the the Israel border, the border between Israel and Lebanon, who still not only maintain the capability to launch terrorist attacks against Israel, but are still launching terrorist attacks against Israel, continue to rain rockets down uh, uh, on Israel from just across the border. So it is, in a, it is a different conflict in a different space. Um, we have never thought the two conflicts ought to be linked together, but obviously um, there are those in the region who have seen the, the two of them is linked. So ultimately, we want to see a diplomatic resolution to that conflict. We want to see it an end to the fighting there. We want to see it done in a way that uh, guarantees the implementation of 1701. So Hezbollah actually withdraws north of the Latani River. Um, I can't put a timetable on it as it relates to the work that we want to do in Gaza. They're separate tracks, separate organizations, and we'll pursue them separately. And just a final thing, just logistically, um, you, know, you mentioned in the next, in the in recent days, have there already been talks by the Secretary of others? You mentioned he was on the phone from, from Air Force One with the Israelis specifically uh, since uh, since the news came in. Uh, so we've had a number of conversations with the Israeli government, both as we were waiting to have this information confirmed. They notified us early this morning um, that they believed they had killed Sinwar, but they wanted to, to uh, conduct testing to confirm it. And then we had a number of conversations, as you might imagine, at several different levels um, uh, to try and confirm that information. And we'll have further conversations in the days ahead. I think, as you saw, uh, saw the president say in his statement, he plans to, um, to speak to Prime Minister Netanyahu in the near future. Uh, you just said that the Israelis notified um, U.S early this morning that they believe Sinwar was killed. Um, can you just give us a little bit more detail? Was that notification, did it come through this building or did it go to the White House or the Pentagon? Do you know where that channel it, was? It came in multiple channels. There were people in this building who were notified. There were people in our embassy who were notified. Uh, I certainly would expect that people in the Pentagon and people uh, in the White House were notified as well. As you know, we have multiple channels of communication with the, uh, the government of Israel, and we were told over multiple channels early, early this morning. And you also, you know, you and other U.S. officials in the last hour have been saying now it's a time to bring an end to this war between um, Hamas and Israel. Uh, but we've been watching as Israel has been conducting these counterterrorism operations in Gaza because they say Hamas is reconstituting. If the time is now to bring an end to this conflict, should they stop those counterterrorism operations? So Israel achieved 
an incredibly important strategic objective today. Uh, but there are other strategic objectives remain. First and foremost among them, the return of the hostages, including the seven Americans who remain held hostage. So um, we want to see those hostages returned home. I know Israel wants to see those hostages return home, uh, and it's important that they continue to work to return those hostages home. But ultimately, we want to make sure that um, uh, they take the strategic objectives that they have accomplished, and today was a significant one, but they've accomplished other strategic objectives over the course of the past year in degrading Hamas's military capabilities to the extent that in no sense could they launch an attack today that looked anything like the attack of last October 7th. Um, they are in no way a functioning uh, military force the way that they were on October 7th, though they, of course, still maintain significant ability to wreak havoc and, and launch terror, terror, uh, terrorist attacks. So what we want to see from them, and this is what we'll be discussing with them, is how they take those strategic objectives that they have met and turn that into an enduring strategic victory. And from our perspective, that means a path forward in Gaza that isn't just a military path forward for degrading Hamas and continuing to fight Hamas fighters over and over and seeing um, uh, 100 fighters killed and 100 new fighters join uh, over the course of a day or a month and being in this perpetual cycle of continuing to, f to fight on the ground there. What we want to see is a path forward that brings the hostages home and sets the conditions for the day after, where you have reconstruction in Gaza, you have actual security in Gaza, and you have a political path forward for the people in Gaza that is determined by the people in Gaza. And so those are the conversations we are going to have with the government of Israel, as well as with our other partners in the days ahead. Those are the conversations the secretary started already today with his counterparts in Qatar and Saudi Arabia. But I guess you didn't answer the question as to how the counterterrorism operations that are ongoing fit into that. Um, if you want them to drive forth an enduring victory, you said, should they stop those counterterrorism operations because Hamas has already been dismantled to such a significant degree? Look, Hamas still does pose a threat, and Israel still has a right to take on that threat, and they still have a right to try and put pressure on Hamas and try and free the hostages that remain there. But ultimately, we think the path forward is not just to continue military operations that they will have to repeat over and over again. Um, because in our judgment, and in the judgment of our partners in the region and our partners around the world, and it, a path forward that doesn't include the reconstruction and security and rebuilding and, uh, and a political path forward in Gaza is not a path that will actually provide an end to the war. And that's what we want to see ultimately as an end to the war. Now, I can't tell you that that's something that we'll have agreement on with the Israeli government tomorrow or next week or with partners in the region. Um, but it's something that we're going to continue to pursue. And then do you have an early assessment as to where, you know, given you said you've been in regular contact with Israeli officials over the last few hours, we saw the speech from Prime Minister Netanyahu. Do you have an initial assessment as to where Netanyahu stands on this right now? Um, you know, if he's going to be in lockstep with the United States and driving forth an end to this conflict so, after Sinwar's death? Uh, so the president's going to talk to the prime minister in the co in the coming days. I think it's appropriate to wait for that conversation before and then we just offer last any question. kind of assessment. The, yeah, that makes sense. The day after plan, um, there have been many conversations in this building about when you guys are going to uh, release that that, you know, has been long worked on in this building. Is the time now? So. I don't want to preview any announcements, uh, but obviously we want to seize the opportunity created by the death of Sinwar. And that means an opportunity to end the war, and it means an opportunity to get to the day after. And so we have been working on this for months, and it's not just happening inside this building, but as you know, happening in conversations with our partners, first and foremost in the region, but also our partners uh, in other countries around the world. and. We do want to look to push those plans forward uh, in the days ahead. I'm not going to preview any specific announcements or give any any specific timing. Again, we're only hours after what is a, fairy, a fairly seismic event, 
but certainly it's something that we want to pursue aggressively in the days ahead. Thanks. Daphne. Uh, thank you. To follow up on Sean's questions about Le Lebanon, um, Jake Sullivan just said nothing in the Middle East is unrelated. So how can you delink the ceasefire in Gaza from the fighting in Lebanon and pursue these separately? So that's the point I just made, which is we have never believed that the two conflicts ought to be linked together. And just when you look at it, you're pursuing separate um, diplomatic resolutions with the state of Lebanon um, and trying to find a ceasefire agreement um, uh, in Gaza. So, of course, Hezbollah linked the two conflicts, even when we didn't think they were linked, and Hezbollah has continued to, to, to link the conflicts. What we have always <laughs> believed is stability brings about stability. So if you could bring an end to the conflict in Gaza, that heightens the chances of reaching a diplomatic resolution to the flight across the blue line, and that remains our assessment. And then Netanyahu said today that their task is not complete, that they will continue full force until the hostages return, and that the war is still not over. What's your reaction to those comments? Do you see them at, at odds at all with Biden's statement, which mentioned ending the war and the administration's aim of trying to push forward the ceasefire proposal? So. As I said a, a moment ago in response to another question, they have a very real, very legitimate strategic objective that they need to continue to pursue, which is the return of all the hostages. Um, and we um, uh, uh, have a very real interest in that objective as well, because seven of those 101 hostages are Americans, and we want to see them return. So we're going to be in conversation with them about the best way to achieve that objective uh, in the days ahead. But as you know, we've long been clear that we think um, uh, reaching a ceasefire that brings those hostages home um, uh, and sets the conditions for an end of the war is the, the right path forward. And we've had long standing conversations with Israel about that. And we hope we have an opportunity now. Is continued fighting a viable path for the return of hostages at all, or is it a ceasefire? So as I just said, Long term, no, we don't believe it is. We don't believe that uh, it's not just that whether it's a, a path for the return of hostages. You could see how you would, you might return some hostages in one off operations here and there. Um, but no, you're not going to return all the hostages through fighting, nor are you going to achieve a durable, lasting end to the war just by fighting on the battlefield. Because uh, you kill one terrorist and see that terrorist replaced by someone else. And so ultimately, you need to find not just, uh, you need to, to achieve not just military objectives, but also political objectives. And you need to create a pathway forward for the Palestinian people. Are there specific steps that you want to see Israel take in the coming days and weeks toward a ceasefire? Now, we're going to have those conversations privately with them before we talk uh, about it publicly. Again, as I, I predicted, I would say this in response to another question. We are just hours after um, uh, this event. I think it's appropriate to let the president have a conversation with the prime minister, appropriate for the secretary to have conversations with his counterparts before we prescribe too much of that uh, from this podium. Um, and sorry, last one. Uh, on the conversations that you mentioned Blinken has had today, has he specifically discussed post-war Gaza? Uh, he has. Yeah. Thank you, Matt. Uh, uh, just to, going back to your opening remarks and the statement that we heard from the uh, VP Harris and the statement issued by President Biden, Sullivan of the White House as well, all considering killing Sunwar is a, an, a renewed opportunity to end the war in Gaza. And as you said, your priority is first to release the hostages, stop the fighting, and allow the Palestinians to rebuild their homes. But maybe there's also the question now arise that something that used to bother you when you when we asked asked you before that this didn't start on October 7, it started long ago. And if not solving those roots in the future, October 7 will keep happening again. And uh, my 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 question is: Yes, you helped Israel to milit with weapons and weapon shipments and also political cover to achieve the military objective of eliminating the threats in Gaza and now the ongoing uh, operation in southern Lebanon. But what are you going to do after the, the, the war to push Israel more toward the solution that you see fit for this conflict, especially that advising them is not seems to be enough? So. It's not just the United States making clear um, our views on this question, but it is countries in the region and countries around the world who have made clear their views on this question. In some cases, it's not just their views, it's their policies. So 
you will recall that on a trip the secretary made earlier this year, um, he went to Israel and made clear that what he had heard from countries in the region is that they were ready for a new path forward with Israel as well. There are countries in the region that were ready to put aside decades-long disputes and normalize relations with Israel um, and present a new alliance of countries inside the region that would isolate Iran. So there are enormous benefits for Israel's security, for Israel's economic development, for Israel's relations with its neighbors and its standing in the world to finding a political path forward that allows the Palestinian people to realize their aspirations. Now, I, I, I get the tension inherent in your question, which is we cannot make that choice for the government of Israel or for the people of Israel. All we can do is lay out to them the upside of ultimately moving forward with a path to a reunited Gaza and the West Bank and a political path forward for the Palestinian people. And we can lay out the risks of not pursuing that path, and the risks are well known. Um, but it is Israel that has to make that decision in the same way that other countries in the decision have to, in the, in the region have to make their own decisions about the types of relationships that they want to have with Israel. Our plan, Matt, I mean, you must know that the world doesn't work this way. A country, if one country doesn't uh, adhere to UN Security Council resolutions, and in fact, there will always be ways to force them toward it, whether by UN sanctions, American sanctions, more pressure on the government to abide by the international law. And the international law states that the West Bank is an occupied land and the two-state two solutions is the way forward. But I'm asking you, I know that, that other countries in the, in the international community agrees with you, but you are blocking the international agencies like the UN and, and others from taking any action toward Israel to force it into making this decision. And at the same time, you as a, the most powerful Israel ally will not talk, take these steps as well. You are just getting, you are, what are you doing? As I heard um, many, several times here in this, uh, in this briefing, you advise them and whatever they wanna do, they're gonna do. Because we believe that ultimately, this is a pathway forward that needs to be negotiated among the parties, not imposed upon them. And that has been the longstanding position of the United States. It will continue to be our position. But without making any predictions of what will happen in the future, the two paths that I just laid out are very stark. And they're very different paths for the state of Israel. And they're very different paths for the region. Um, and so we and other countries in the region will continue to make clear to Israel the risks of uh, continued instability. and the real rewards of a path forward for the Palestinian people, and they will have to make their decisions just as other countries do. Thank you. Yeah, Livia. Thank you, Matt. Um, does the U.S. believe right now that the hostages who are still in Gaza are at greater risk and greater danger? What's the message to families who are seriously concerned about their safety at what may be a critical period? Look, I, I don't have any assessment to um, make on that, make, make from here. Um, obviously, again, we're just in the early hours after. Um, uh, I would make clear to anyone who is considering harming any hostage, American or otherwise, that they will be held accountable. They should be held accountable in the same way that Yah Sinwar was held accountable for murdering civilians and taking them hostages. In, as it pertains to any communication to the families of hostages and to their loved ones, we will make, give those communications privately. As you know, we have been in close touch with the families of the seven Americans who continue to be held and will continue to be in close touch with them about the, the status and the well-being of their loved ones. Okay. And so apart from reinvigorating ceasefire and hostage talks, there are no specific steps being taken right now vis-a-vis -vis American or other hostages? With the, the specific step that is being undertaken, uh, which I, I don't mean to suggest, sound like you're downplaying in the, uh, in the premise of the question. That's the step that we need to take to try and get them home. Um, it's, in our judgment, the most fruitful path to bringing them home is to get an agreement that gets them out. As I said, it's long been our position that um, just the way uh, the, the situation on the ground, the way the situation on the ground works is you are not going to return all those hostages home through military action. You may see 
operations here and there that can return some hostages, but that ultimately to bring all of them home safely, um, you need to reach an agreement um, that helps bring about an end to the war. Um, obviously, today's development comes against the backdrop of what had been heightened tensions and expected Israeli retaliatory strike on Iran uh, for its earlier ballistic missile attack on October 1st. What is the U.S.'s understanding uh, as to whether that may go forward? Uh, I'm not going to read those conversations out publicly, as I have, uh, I think, scrupulously declined to do uh, over the past few weeks. Okay. Um, Iranian media is referring to Sinwar's death as a, as a martyrdom, uh, saying he was killed while battling Israeli forces on the battlefield. Um, what is the risk, how significant is the risk that his death, rather than subduing militant groups in the region, emboldens them at this point? Uh, I, I am sure that Hamas and other terrorist groups will try to present Sinwar as some kind of hero for the Palestinian cause. But I think it's important that everyone remember the actual facts, which is that Sinwar was a brutal terrorist that didn't just terrorize the Israeli people, but that ruled Gaza with an iron fist before October 7th, that um, uh, brutalized Palestinians in Gaza, that tortured Palestinians in Gaza, and then unleashed a conflict that has been responsible for the death of more than 40,000 Palestinians. So uh, I would hope that anyone that's considering thinking of him in any favorable light at all will look on the actual consequences of his life and the decisions that he made um, that wreaked such havoc for the Palestinian people. Last one from me. Um, the Prime Minister Netanyahu, in his remarks today, paraphrasing, basically said, you know, that Israel had resisted all kinds of pressure. He didn't name the provenance of the pressure, but all kinds of international pressure to stop the war, stop the fighting, uh, and uh, not enter Rafah. Um, with today's developments, in, in hindsight, I know it's early, but does it seem like uh, the U.S.'s calls to not enter Rafah, to try to broker a ceasefire, were preemptive or at least um, never going to meet with uh, Israeli approval or, you know, acceptance? No, I will say that we always made clear that we supported Israel conducting counterterrorism operations to target the leaders of Hamas and to target Hamas militants. And not to, only did we make clear we supported it, but we provided active intelligence support for those operations. Uh, and I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Tom. Um, I mean, the, the ceasefire hostage release deal that has been on the table and I think was last discussed in person with the Israelis by the Secretary it was the last trip we were on, um, the ninth trip, I think, out of ten. And that's, I'm assuming, although it's, there hasn't been any meaningful discussion, but it's still on the table, that. Correct. Um, and so I'm trying to understand from the Israeli perspective, given the death of Sinwar, if you couldn't get that past Benjamin Netanyahu, and I think during that time, it was when a senior official said that Mr. Netanyahu was making maximalist statements and it wasn't conductive to uh, getting the ceasefire deal done. I'm just trying to understand why now there's any more reason than there was then for him to accept such a deal. Because he's not the only party to this arrangement, and the other party to this arrangement is the one who had refused to negotiate at all. We did have important decisions we were going to need the prime minister and the government of Israel to make, but we had seen them make uh, concessions already, and it was our assessment we could get to a deal. And then in the middle of that, Sinwar walked away from the table. So without making any predictions and, and about what will happen, and, and I'll just refer you to what I said at the beginning of this briefing, which is, without a doubt, there are tough decisions for Israel to make to get to an ultimate agreement. Without a doubt. We're the first to say that, and we're the first, we are the people engaging with them to try and convince them to make those tough decisions. But you had on the other side a roadblock. An absolute stonewalled no, and that person is removed, that we think presents an opportunity. Absolutely. But at that point, you know, the deal that is on the table was still not strong enough. Was not, there wasn't enough incentive for but, Mr. Netanyahu to accept it either. And what's but, happened now is he's put himself in a far the, stronger position so, because uh, what's happened on the ground. So, so what that leaves out is that we were negotiating with him and we were negotiating with Hamas over how to get to yes. And we believe that we could get to an agreement. And then Sinwar ended the negotiations while we were in the process of trying to get there. That's what, that, that is the, the, the difference in what was happening in the way that you presented the question. Okay, it's just, 
I think, and this is to develop Olivia's point, is that, you know, from Mr. Netanyahu's perspective now, you have a situation where, and he said in the speech there, he's saying he's calling for surrender, he's calling for Hamas people who have uh, holding hostages to come out, lay down their arms, release hostages. There's nothing that I can see in what he's saying about getting the hostages released and the end to the war via discussion, diplomacy, ceasefire talks. This is all about military pressure, which he is suggesting he has vindicated, he is vindicated by against, as he said, all the pressures. And I assume he means subtly American pressure, particularly with Rafa. So he is, as far as I can see, he's saying military, a military solution to this is vindicated. Uh, keep going and try and get hostages released via surrender or whatever. No offense, but that Tom, doesn't but is there a that. question? Yeah, coming sorry. No, no, I'm just, <laughs> well, I'm saying, how are you going to incentivize him now? Because this to him is a military vindication and, and, and a way in which to, to keep going and not as you want, which is a future, a viable Palestinian future in the Gaza Strip. He wants Israeli control effectively with a minimal sort of local... Right, so let me get to it. So I'm asking what, what the incentives uh, you're, you're laying out <laughs> so the, it was, Yeah, it was the same. It still, still took a while to get to the question. Look, we believe the incentives are the return of the 101 hostages, and we believe the incentive is a path forward that provides increased security for Israel. And we had gotten agreement from them. If you go back and remember, and remember that even before we got to this this position in July and August where we were arguing over the implementation details, we had an agreement that Israel had accepted that Hamas refused. So it's just not accurate to say that Israel had never agreed to, and you didn't say that, I'm not trying to, to put words in your mouth. Israel had agreed to a ceasefire proposal that we put on the table, um, and Hamas didn't accept it. They came back with provisions that they wanted to change and negotiated, and then we had to bridge differences between the two parties, and Hamas walked away. So I can't tell you what the government of Israel is going to do, direct those questions to them. We believe it is in their interest to ultimately find an uh, agreement to the end of the war. We've seen them previously be willing to engage in those conversations. We've seen that there are proposals that they accepted. Uh, we hope now that there is a party uh, on the other side that's willing to engage in conversations. And on that, just on the, what you've, the, the discussion with uh, Qatar is today, is there anything you can read out about that? The discussions with, with the, oh, the, Qatari, the leadership of Qatar? Uh, no, nothing further. On the, they had a, a discussion about it, but um, uh, we have a lot of work to do in the days ahead, and we intend to pursue that work. Sorry. Thank you, Matt. Uh, I'm struck by uh, how you described the killing of uh, Sinwar as a seismic event. Really, you believe that it was a seismic event at the level of, let's say, something like a nuclear bomb or something like that? Really, I mean, it is absolutely a seismic event in the Middle East. When you look at who he was and who, what he was responsible for, he was someone who made the decision, and it was, his, as I said at the beginning, it was his decision to launch the terrorist attacks, someone who, after the death of Hania, didn't just have military control of Hamas, but had political control of Hamas as well. And he is the person who has been the prime obstacle to ending the war and stopping the suffering of the Palestinian people. So absolutely, well, it is, a, it is an important event. It was a firefight. He had two other people with him. I, mean, I suppose you know, we disagree a, about the relative okay. importance of the death Whatever, of Sinwar. That's what the, I think that's it's a pretty important event. are saying, not me. I don't know. Now, let me ask you a couple of things now. You, uh, you keep saying uh, that Hamas absolutely refused uh, you know. Uh, as far as all the people that were involved in negotiations from the Arab side, the Qataris, the Egyptians, and so on, they all say that Hamas agreed 100% to your proposal. No, they, it was the Israelis they that don't, rejected They don't, Saeed. And they and went they on. They don't, Saeed, and that's not what okay. happened. And you and well, I have been through this before. That's fine. I'm just trying to, you know. I know, but you, you and I have been through this before. Right. They came okay. back with a counter proposal, which is not an acceptance of the proposal that was put forward and endorsed by the United Nations Security Council. If I, if I give you a proposal, Saeed, and you come back and say, I agree to seven of the things you propose, and on these three others, I have major changes. Okay. That is not an acceptance of my right. proposal. But the answer, the Israeli answer, was to go ahead and kill the chief negotiator, right? Who was not carrying a gun, was sleeping actually in a guest house, wasn't it? What is there a question? And Saeed? I'm just saying at that point. Okay, yes, I do have a couple of questions. You, uh, you also said that whoever comes next, you know, Hamas, they would look back and reassess what happened in the last year and so on. I didn't say Is they that, would. I said I hoped they would. I, you hoped they would. Yes, I, I said that you hope that they would. Does that mean that you would be, you would be uh, willing to 
negotiate with Hamas directly? If someone, no, no, if someone, no. The Hamas so, is a terrorist organization. The United States does not right. engage with terrorist organizations. But of course, we will engage so, with our mediators who, right. who okay. engage. So, what would be the incentive for those? I mean, it seems now that no one is is having command and control over Hamas. I mean, it, uh, probably it's what would be everyone is running. What would be own. the incentive? Site. Like, how about an end to the war? No, how I about understand. stopping the the death of Palestinian civilians? Mm -hmm. how, well, maybe, how, maybe, what maybe, more incentive? Right. Should a leader of Hamas need than that? Right. Okay, but I'm saying that uh, if someone like Sinwar, who exerted a great deal of power and control and so on, was uh, unable to basically, you know, uh, negotiate or do something like this, or, or make sure that he could deliver uh, Hamas, what makes you think that? So, so you know, I, I don't. Can't... I don't think you should make excuses for Sinwar. He no, was no, not I'm unable not, not to making, negotiate. Just, he was unwilling to negotiate. I'm, I'm Let's be clear about it. You're saying he had he every was... ability to negotiate right. and into okay. this war, and he refused to. I'm it's a, it's now, a big difference. You know, now that he's gone, you know, probably there is no structure. I don't know. I mean, uh, so we don't know who is in control. Maybe, maybe like uh, you know, uh, maybe the hostages are in more peril. Let me ask you another question on. Uh, yeah, this is uh, yeah. Let me. Uh, Okay. All right, let me ask you a question on... I didn't think that was a question, so I wasn't responding uh, to it. Let me ask you a question <laughs> on, on a proposal that is being, you know, suggested uh, that uh, Secretary Blinken is going to consider proposing right after the election about, uh, you know, that the Israelis and the Emiratis and so on are, are coming up with some sort of a, the day after. Uh, can you share with us, is there, is there something uh, to, to that report or to this suggestion or... Uh, would, would we hear something? So I spoke to this yesterday. We have it in discussions with right. our Emirati partners, with right. Israeli partners, with other countries in the region of, uh, uh, as well. That's been a, uh, the, the subject of a number of trips that the secretary has conducted and has been the subject of ongoing diplomatic conversations. And uh, I'm not going to, to predict from here when we might put so, forward some, pro, uh, some type of proposal, but we are very much seized okay. with agreeing with our partners in the region on a proposal to provide actual security and governance and a political path forward for the Palestinian but, people. But it seems that the Israelis are, they want to see, uh, you know, a diminished role for the PA and, and uh, Mahmoud Abbas and, and, and the PLO, uh, apparently. Would you agree? So like we have always made clear that uh, one of the principles to which we adhere uh, is unified West Bank and Gaza under the uh, Palestinian, under Palestinian authority control, where the people of the West Bank and Gaza can choose their leadership, not anyone else. Uh, yeah, Michelle. Can we move uh, to Lebanon? Yeah. If you don't mind. Uh, first, uh, how can the United States help uh, the Lebanese people to move uh, the political process forward when the U.S. close friend, uh, Speaker of the House, uh, Berri and Hezbollah, his partner, have been blocking the election uh, of a new president. Uh, is the U.S. ready to uh, put pressure on Speaker Berry to convene the parliament and elect a new president? So it's not a question of the United States putting pressure on uh, the Lebanese um, uh, political decision makers. Those are decisions that they have to make for themselves. Um, but we are engaged with multiple members of the Lebanese government, and we are engaged with our partners in the region, who we also know have been engaged with the uh, leaders of the Lebanese government, and we have all had a singular message, which is it is time for the parliament to move forward with electing a president, finally. Now, what else we can do? We can work to strengthen Lebanese institutions, primarily the Lebanese armed forces, which we see as a bulwark for security and stability inside Lebanon, and we have supported um, uh, with direct financial assistance over the, the, the past couple of decades, and we will continue to support because we think the role that they can play in providing stability, and as one of the most respected institutions uh, in the country, uh, is an incredibly important one, uh, and it has to be maintained. Did you ask uh, Speaker Berry to convene the parliament to elect a new president? We made very clear uh, to the Speaker and to the Prime Minister that we think it is important that the Parliament elect a new president in the days and weeks ahead. Specific steps I'm not going to get into. Uh, on uh, uh, Israel uh, incursion, uh, did you get any sense from Israel for how long will this military operation uh, last in the south? Uh, I think I should let them speak to their timetables. Uh, it's not something I should do from here. And will the U.S. attend the ministerial uh, meeting on Lebanon in Paris? Uh, uh, I expect that we will be represented there. I don't have any announcements to make about should who. Should we expect any uh, financial aid or political announcement? 
Uh, so the conference is still a week away. I think stay tuned um, uh, until next week before to look for any kind of announcements coming out of it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Can you talk a little bit about how much the U.S. are involved with Israel in his killing? Uh, this was an Israeli operation exclusively. In what about intelligence? So we have provided them intelligence uh, since the beginning of this conflict to help them uh, locate and fight and bring to justice the leaders of Hamas. And I do think that that intelligence has been successful in increasing the pressure on those leaders. Uh, but when it comes to this specific operation, this was an Israeli uh, operation, and I'll let them speak to the details of it. Alex. Thank you. Okay. Based on everything you have said so far on this subject, uh, is it your assessment that today we are one day closer to the end of the conflict or one day away from that? So I just don't want to make any, any predictions other than to say that a major obstacle to the end of the conflict has been removed. And we think that provides an opportunity, but I'm not going to make any predictions about what's going to come in the days ahead. Different conflict uh, sanctions were announced today uh, on Chinese drone companies. The language that you guys have used suggested, uh, they suggest that uh, China has been apparently producing and, and, and sending uh, you know, weapons to Russia to use in Ukraine. This is the first time that's departure from its uh, promises to, to the U.S. Is that uh, uh, so, a fair assessment? Of so we have seen uh, for some time Chinese company pr companies providing components to uh, Russian companies that Russian companies then use to um, uh, turn into machinery, weapons, other ele other components that um, Russia could use in its war. This was the first, and we have, we have imposed sanctions uh, on a number of those companies. This was the first time we actually saw a Chinese company manufacturing a weapon itself that then was used on the battlefield by Russia, was sent to Russia and then used on the battlefield. And that's why we imposed the sanctions that we did today. And that is why we continue to um, work with our allies and partners around the world to make clear to China that this practice is unacceptable and they need to take steps to counter it. Thank you. And on Tuesday, you expressed your concerns about reports on North Korea spying troops uh, to, for Russia uh, to use in Ukraine. Two days past, the secretary had a phone call with his counterpart in Ukraine, and the president spoke with uh, President Zelensky. Do you have any new intelligence? They do have. Did they hand it to you? Any details? Anything uh, you have learned? I don't have anything further I can offer today. I mean, uh, China, North Korea, now Iran. You know, um, if you ask average Ukrainians, they're going to tell you how they expect us to fight against all these powers mm -hmm. all along. Because they have on their side the United States of America, uh, a number of countries uh, in Europe, a number of countries around the world. Remember, we have marshaled a coalition of 50 countries, more than 50 countries, who support Ukraine's. Mm -hmm in territorial integrity and sovereignty and have continued to provide support in a number of ways, military support, economic support, diplomatic support over the past two years, and we'll continue to provide support. I guess my question is, like, does it, do this, all these new facts change the calculus on your end in terms of? No. Uh, Thank you, Mark. Um, sorry to interrupt. No, I was, I was moving. OK, thank you. Uh, when you speak about ending the war, uh, does that in include full uh, Israeli withdrawal from Gaza? You have repeatedly said that you oppose the reoccupation of Gaza. Um, does that position still stand? Of course, of course. And uh, Israeli opposition leader and former war cabinet mi minister Benny Gantz just said on Twitter that the IDF will continue to operate in Gaza for years to come. Would that be acceptable for you? So I'm not going to respond to a statement that I have not seen. I think it sounds like that came out while I was at the podium. I haven't seen its full context, but I will just say, as a matter of fact, uh, we ultimately want to see Israel fully withdrawn from Gaza. Now, they have a right to, as any country does, to address terrorist threats against its people. But what we want to see as an end to this war is the terrorist threat from Gaza eliminated. And we want to see uh, uh, ultimately a political path that establishes a Palestinian state that is not hostile to Israel. And so, of course, you wouldn't want to see and wouldn't need to see the IDF operating in that environment. Yeah, when the war ends, we will never see IDF operating in Gaza anymore, right? Like complete withdrawal. Uh, well, I'm sorry, what like was the complete withdrawal of uh, yes, the Yes, that's what we want to see is, them, is a complete withdrawal. That's what, that's what we meant when the secretary laid out almost a year ago several, uh, a number of principles that we wanted to see for the end of the conflict, and one of them was no occupation of Gaza. Prem. Thank you, Matt. Um, our colleagues at Politico 
reported that a U.S. envoy told aid groups that the U.S. would not consider withholding weapons to Israel for blocking food and medicine. That essentially the rules don't apply to Israel. Given it's not that, essential. No, forget what the essentially. That's not not at all an accurate representation of of her comments. That's no, not, not sorry, all. Sorry. Not, that's not all. The not not of all of which. Not was. all of which were accurate accurately presented in that article. I would say should note as always with these, you have what becomes a, a secondhand presentation put into an article. Not all of those comments were in any way accurate. Sure, but was the the basic characterization of her describing your I'm not going to speak to a to a private meeting but we have always made clear that we are committed to the defense of Israel we will continue to support the defense of Israel but we also are going to enforce US law so you will enforce US law including uh, the, if you look at the letter that the secretary aid. if you look at the letter the secretary sent uh, the other day he said that there are a number of US laws and policies that are implemented by um, Israel not taking steps to uh, allow humanitarian assistance to get in and we will enforce US law but we're going to we want to see Israel take increased steps we've seen them take some increased steps over the last few days but we need to see much more I guess there have been previous instances for which like this threat has been um, sort of floated whether it's in the wake of this seven world central kitchen workers that were killed whether it was in uh, before uh, any sort of major operation in Rafa of course the administration uh, maintains that there wasn't a major operation but nevertheless there have been instances for which this threat has been offered and yet there hasn't been any actualization of it. So I know that your objective is to see the end of U.S. support to Israel. Our objective is to see Israel take steps to increase humanitarian assistance getting into Gaza. We have other steps as well, but that's relevant to the conversation we're having now. And so our engagement with them on this question has been to push them to take steps. And at times, we've seen them take really important steps. When we had this last uh, uh, major engagement with them in April, we saw them take uh, a number of steps to open new crossings, and it got trucks up to 300 to 400 in some days. Now we saw significant first stagnation and then backsliding over the com last few months, which is why um, the secretary felt it was important to send that letter uh, this Sunday. To be clear, Sean, my, objective is, not almost, to, my um, objective is to ask about the U.S. enforcement I understand, laws. Sean. It's not to do Can that. we actually go to Western Sahara? Um, yeah, well, wait a second. I thought I had dibs on well, you, you either You either <laughs> one, but I'm, I'm going to disappoint you with my answer, so go ahead. What? I'm going to disappoint you with my answer. Only go ahead now. I shouldn't. I shouldn't. I should. I should. I should, I should let you live through the disappointment, whether than, rather than preview it. So, Sean, go ahead with the question. Uh, no, 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 no. I'm giving the answer now, but uh, does the U.S. support a partition of Western Sahara? Uh, I'm going to need to take that question back, only because, uh, as you might imagine, I was entirely focused on uh, the events in the events in yes, Gaza you've yesterday. Been, you've haven't, spent haven't, decades haven't, as a haven't, scholar haven't, of haven't reviewed, Sahara, haven't reviewed the action. The pol haven't the reviewed the Sarajevo. action at all, or discussed it with any of my colleagues. So, so let me take it back so and the, get the, you an so answer. Just to be clear, there is no action per se. It's just the UN envoy's proposal, the proposal which is the right. sa same proposal that former Secretary of State James Baker made when he was in that same envoy position, which is to partition Western Sahara between Morocco and the Polisario. And so the question is. So only because I, I realize you can't. The extent answer that, I know so about the proposal the is that the the uh, one was made today, and I didn't have any chance to look at it at all or talk to my colleagues. I do want to take that question back. And the U.S. And get, still stands by supporting Moroccan sovereignty over Western Sahara. There has the been no change in our policy. Could I ask you a separate question, uh, slightly different? Uh, the Taliban. Uh, you might have seen this. They issued rules today, uh, not today, this week, about uh, banning, um, uh, banning publication of living beings, images of living beings. So I guess they wouldn't be watching this briefing. But, but do you have any, um, uh, any reaction? On, on, on? <laughs> I'm going to have to plead ignorance on this one, too. I'm not aware. I'll take the question back sure. and get you an answer. Go ahead, Daphne, and then we'll wrap for today. Uh, thank you. Venezuela's interior minister said today that three more Americans have been detained for alleged terrorist activities. Do you have any reaction to this? And do you know when they were arrested? So uh, we've seen the reports. We're monitoring them and gathering uh, more information. Obviously, the safety and security of American citizens anywhere uh, around the world is our first priority. Um, and we're going to gather more information about this in the, the hours ahead. And with that, wrap for today. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.